Morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you very much for attending the Contract Management Best Practices webinar held by uh, the Advisory Body on Legal Matters, ABOM. I can see that um, people are slowly coming in. Um, so I think, but I think in the interest of time, since we don't have a lot of time, um, we can already um, get started. So um, just for a few housekeeping uh, uh, um, rules before we start, and there are quite a lot of us online and we have a limited amount of time. So I would ask that if anyone has a question, if you could direct it through the Q&A tab um, and um, in written form. And then after that, <laughs> towards the end of the meeting, we will then have a questions and answer session where we will endeavor to answer your questions as much as possible. If, you, um, if your question doesn't get answered, then you can also feel free to send a message to us via email and we will endeavor to, to come back to you as soon as possible on that. So um, before I hand over the floor, um, I will just uh, quickly welcome our speakers today. Uh, we have Dr. Yontao Yang, who is the chair of uh, the ABOM, the Theater Advisory Body on Legal Matters. Um, we have the ABOM experts, uh, Professor Manuel Alba Fernandez, uh, Mr. John Stubbings and Mr. Mike Yarwood. Um, you should have received everyone's biographies <laughs> already by email, so I won't go in, in, uh, in any detail about that because I think that our speakers have um, so many achievements that it will take way too long for me to go through. Um, and then of course, uh, just to introduce myself, I'm Andrea Tang, the uh, Fiatta ABOM manager, and I'm joined here by the Fiesta Director General, Stefan Grabe and uh, Madeline Gurria. And um, as you will, um, most of you will know, the ABOM is a Fiatta advisory body comprised of professional legal experts, and it acts to provide guidance to Fiatta Association members on the development of legal matters such as contract management, which of course is a very crucial aspect in our daily uh, business. So I give the floor now to Dr. Yang. Thank you, Andrea. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, dear ladies and gentlemen. Warmly welcome all of you to this special session of ABLM for the release of our new publication, Best Practice Guide on Contract Management. As a routine, let me start by reading the FIATA competition compliance statement. FIATA policy strictly prohibits any discussion or other communication, the purpose of effect of which is to set prices, allocate markets or customers, engage in tying arrangements, or refrain from any purchasing any goods or any services from any particular supplier or vendor. It is mandatory that you are familiar with self, familiarize yourself with FIATA's <coughs> antitrust policy, which the secretary has made it available to all the participants. I'm very proud to see this is the first best practice guide issued by our ABLM to assist our FIATA members and this international logistics and free forwarding industry in dealing with various legal challenges. <clears throat> Last year, we published the guide on abandoned cargo to tackle with the increasing challenge of goods abandoned during the pandemic. And before that, in the term of my, pre uh, in my, uh, in the term of my uh, predecessor, Mr. Richard Clark, ABOM issued the two guests on prevention of cybercrime and bribery respectively. ABOM will keep up this uh, momentum and select the topics which are most relevant to our members. And if you have some uh, good idea or some inquiry, please let us know. Contract management undoubtedly plays a critical role in our business, especially for our free forwarder. 
we are confronted with complex and dynamic challenges in complying with distinctive legal requirements in different jurisdictions. Contract management is the first line of defense for our free forwarders. So every free forwarder and every enterprise at large should take special care of it. A good contract is not only a good deal, but also an effective tool to control potential risks. What are the elements you need to look into when facing to first of us the uh, commercial opportunity and how to negotiate good terms, how to conduct due diligence on new customers and subcontractors? What kind of template format we should choose and what are the key terms we need to review? How should you sign the and perform the contract. As a self-discipline organization for our industry, FIATA feels we are obliged to guide our members in dealing with these questions. And that's the main purpose for our ABLM to issue this document. I would like to emphasize this guide would be a deep document. And this is the first step for our job. We are going to review and update it on regular intervals and encourage all of you to share your inputs. Maybe good or maybe suffered experience and some the uh, case studies. I hope that this document could become a helpful guide for your business and uh, a silent mental by our side. I'm honored to have a group of experts in our ABLM to work with me on this project and contribute their knowledge and experience. And also including Andrea Mandelin from Sec Fiat Secretariat and also Angela Sung, my Sanotrans colleagues. Let me thank them for the next drop down. Today, three experts will present you their profound ideas behind the page. And also, uh, Angela Song maybe will share her experience for uh, being as the uh, uh, in house counsel. So after that, we will have Andrea to give you a comprehensive overview of the document um, and a practical guide on where to find and download it. By the end of this uh, the meeting, maybe we are honored to invite Mr. President to give a speech on behalf of FIATA. So now let me cut my opening shot and leave the floor for my ex uh, experts. Thank you very much. Okay, um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Can you hear me well? Yes, please. Good, thank you so much. Um, thank you very much uh, to Andre and to uh, Dr. Yang for, for their kind introduction. Now, looking into the, um, the contract management guide, as many of you have probably seen already, uh, an important part of the of this best practice guide on, on contract management focuses on the preliminary trades or the negotiation phase of the contract. Um, we may say this is a somehow psychological part of the guide uh, because it aims at providing guidance on how to, in fact, prepare for and conduct a negotiation of a contract, okay? But of course, uh, we have to remember here that uh, when we start the preliminary trades and the negotiation of contracts, we don't have a contract yet, okay? And, and nevertheless, this is a, a very, very important part of the life cycle, uh, life cycle of a contract because, and we may say this is already the life of a contract, right? Because what we do uh, during negotiations uh, will determine to a fundamental extent 
the final contract and its effects and probably the final result of our business, okay? And at least in some cases, right? Um, uh, the best practice guide on contract management with regard to this aspect tries to emphasize some basic ideas that may be very briefly summarized in an expression used in scuba diving, uh, which is also very often quoted in business schools and classes and, and conferences. And this says, plan your dive and dive your plan, as you can see on the screen, okay? Uh, so in the first place, uh, the guide tries to highlight the convenience of having some sort of predefined internal protocol or established procedures for the negotiation, conclusion, and execution of contracts. Uh, this would be like having a strategy for this particular task, like we do for many other things in business, in fact, okay? Uh, such an instrument uh, in the second place should ideally clarify how the negotiation of a contract needs to be managed at the internal level. Some things that may be useful to clarify here is the people that should intervene in the negotiation of contracts and at which stage, as well as how the in-house or external counsel or lawyer should be aware of the fact that a negotiation is taking place, should be also duly informed of all steps and is also timely involved at each stage of the process. Um, negotiation of contracts requires discussing many commercial terms that the people involved in the business would normally be familiar with, right? Uh, but it also entails addressing and discussing many terms and ideas uh, with the technical, legal meaning and implications that in some cases uh, may be far from being obvious at first sight, even for a lawyer, okay? Uh, we have to keep in mind that um, negotiating and drafting a business contract nowadays is normally a joint effort by one or more business people in our company, so the ones more in knowledge about the business, but also one or more lawyers, uh, possibly among other persons. So, so this should not be probably uh, conceptualized as the job of just one person, okay? Um, involving the proper people, therefore, is important for successfully managing this phase. Another good idea, in consequence, is to also set uh, procedures for ensuring as much clarity as possible and tidiness as well in internal communications between all the people involved and, and the, the joint work they have to, to undertake in for managing this um, initial stage. Okay. Um, now, uh, in the third place, and in this case at the external level, in relations with third parties with this purpose, any protocol or the approach towards the negotiation of a contract should also aim to ensure uh, the proper identification of the priorities to keep in mind during the process uh, or try to clarify as best as possible how to define them. Uh, negotiating, as all of you know, of course, is about, among other things, setting priorities and try to achieve them, right? Um, a very important point at this stage relates uh, to the precautions that need to be taken or in general, the, the conduct to be followed to maximize clarity in the negotiation process in order to achieve certainty and quality in the final result. Again, these are the principles that would need to be applied particularly once the prospect of a contract arises or as soon as relations with other parties uh, for the negotiation of an agreement start. Uh, so again, two things to ensure here include clarity and awareness. As obvious as simplistic as this may sound, for a good negotiation to take place, we need to spend enough time and effort to ensure clarity in communications and keep the proper awareness of the possible implications of our actions or statements, okay? Uh, one thing to be preferably avoided um, to the extent possible as usual, right? But one thing to be avoided, for instance, would, would be a negotiation uh, purely based on the plain exchange of unilateral communications without a substantive discussion of the contents of the contract. Uh, this is what we see very often in practice, where once the basic commercial terms have been agreed upon, uh, the parties try to leave the rest of the contract to their own general terms and impose those terms on the other party in one way or another, 
right? In many cases, it is best to use general terms, of course, for reasons of time, strategy, and, and practicability, as all of you know as well. And this would be something to be addressed as well in any negotiation protocol or predefined procedures, right? Uh, but even in such cases, uh, we need to be very much aware of what our general terms say and how they would apply to a particular situation, what the terms of the other party say and why and how any of those terms may become part of our final contract. Uh, we need to make sure, for example, that we do not inadvertently accept any terms or conditions communicated by the other party. We may leave clear from time to time that nothing is accepted unless express consent is communicated in writing, for instance. Uh, likewise, uh, we have to have the reflex to react as soon as we see something that we do not like or we cannot accept, uh, whether by making a reservation or simply rejecting a statement or a proposal that we do not see fit. We need to be prepared to seek clarification on anything that we do not completely understand as well, and to carefully scrutinize or interpret the statements by our counterparty in such cases. Um, the reason of all this is that um, unless we ensure this, we may have some uncertainties as to what the contract says, even though we might have consented to its contents, okay? Um, this would be common sense for all of you probably, but again, as surprising as this may sound, as you also do probably know, uh, this is not always the case, okay? For reasons of time and the rush of business and, and the need to keep, you know, um, or market. Uh, in any case, uh, for these and other purposes, and once we have a protocol to manage a negotiation of contracts, uh, the final idea would be that we have to stick to it as much as possible. We not only have to have a good protocol, but once uh, we get into the, um, um, uh, the rush of business, we have to try to stick to it um, as a policy, okay? And try not to depart from its contents unless there is a clear reason to do so. Um, it is very difficult to strictly follow your plan and naturally every situation will have its own particularities, but having a good plan and make an effort to keep it is always an advisable choice in this field. Okay, so thank you very much. I leave the floor uh, to, I think it's John who's speaking now or, or Mike, I don't remember, sorry. Yes, I think it's me next. So uh, good morning, afternoon and evening to everybody uh, and welcome to this session. It's uh, uh, so the two areas that I'm going to look at over the coming slides are due diligence and doing business in unfamiliar jurisdictions. So two critical and complementary uh, considerations uh, both contained within the, within the guide document. Um, so undertaking appropriate due diligence before entering a contract is crucial to know exactly who you are going into business with, uh, which goods that you are handling, how and where, and of course, that you'll be duly compensated for the services that you're going to provide. Operating in a global, fast-paced, digital business environment, the risks are many. However, um, they can be mitigated substantially at the pre-contractual uh, agreement stage simply by having a, a proper and robust due diligence process and procedure in place. One of the key factors in the process is to take one's time. Urgent, last minute, take it or leave it transactions can be the most problematic and it's something we see time and time again and result in circumventing of the due diligence procedure. So again, taking shortcuts to sort of speed through the process. Fundamentally, one, one needs to know with whom they are contracting, uh, whether they are a genuine financially viable entity and whether they're dealing with that entity or shipping particular goods may breach sanctions or require permits or approvals to carry. This is a critical step in protecting your business, so it's important not to be rushed. This is ever more crucial when contracting in unfamiliar jurisdictions, which may require an even more comprehensive due diligence process. The following points are critical to consider when conducting due diligence on a potential contractual party. Verify the identity of the company. Um, do, doing so may, may involve uh, verifying certain information online or through other sources of publicly available data. 
for example, the landline telephone number or sources um, at landline telephone number or the registered address, um, the domain name of the website, company registration number or VAT number. When contracting in unfamiliar jurisdictions, consider also conducting local investigations where possible and actually meeting the company at their primary place of business if possible. Secure details such as their full trading styles, both in English and local language, the names of any directors, banking details and original copy, copies of any applicable insurance documents. And again, the, these are sort of common sense type issues and points, but ones that really are, really are fundamental um, to success and avoiding unwelcome surprises. Conduct a credit check on the company with a credit reference agency, again, where, where possible, and consider appropriate policies or agreements required. Key questions to bear in mind include how much credit the customer is expecting and demanding and on what terms. And again, from your selfish perspective, consider your cash flow. Consider if the customer has material assets or whether it's a company with no substance and no assets. Again, in the event of a large dispute or claim, this again could be a material factor. Consider conducting a peer review. Um, it is valuable, or it can be valuable to look into whether your peers have had experience of dealing with this particular company. Are they, for example, known to adhere to rules and regulations or otherwise, as well as whether they're known to pay on time? Also consider applicable UN, EU, US and national sanctions in relation to the entities involved, as well as the goods themselves. This could include looking into the ownership structure of the customer and the country that they're doing business in. In addition, one should also consider the cargo in question and whether it itself is subject to sanctions or controls requiring further approvals or permits, for example, whether it's a dual use cargo. This information could be secured again from relevant government authorities and agencies. Consider whether the customer has liability insurance in place and if possible, understand the policy limits. Again, this will, this will provide an additional layer of comfort and protection for your business. Consider safety aspects and whether the customer can demonstrate commitment to safety and adherence to applicable regulations. Possible considerations here include misdeclaration of goods, the shipment of dangerous goods and how they're declared, AEO status, ISO accreditation, and cargo or industry specific designations. Consider what goods the customer is shipping to where and when. Um, low value goods as well as goods shipped for waste or recycling can, for example, increase the risk of those goods remaining uncollected or abandoned at the destination port. In addition, there may be certain risks and costs associated with different ports or jurisdictions and such risks should ideally be taken into consideration at a very early stage in the, negoti in the negotiation process. Could I take the next slide, please, Andrea? Thank you. Um, the globalised nature of the supply chain has seen many logistics operators invest in exploring lucrative opportunities in emerging markets. Markets in certain sectors in emerging countries continue to outperform the global average. Extensive investments in, made in the creation of new, new infrastructure, for example, give rise to some large scale expansion and opportunities. Logistics operators, as many other businesses, rely on such regions for growth opportunities within their business. Expansion of operations into such markets, however, does not come without risk. Um, comprehensive due diligence should be completed prior to your business making contractual commitments in what might be considered an unfamiliar jurisdiction. And again, doing so will assist in avoiding unwelcome surprises further down the line. Contracting in unfamiliar jurisdictions can involve greater risks and present greater challenges, both in terms of simply operating day-to-day -day operations and in the event of a dispute arising. And it's important, again, to ensure that those risks are correctly assessed and fully understood. Important considerations in this context can include operational and cultural differences and local regulations and requirements. How easy is it, for example, to actually employ skilled labour locally what are the local health and safety requirements and laws? And do you need, and if you needed to implant your own personnel for a period in, in, a, in this sort of um, country where you're going to do business, how readily available are working visas? There is some high level guidance which can be found as a starting point in the World Bank Doing Business Index, 
But again, working closely with local uh, lawyers, local experts and local agents will help to build the uh, a rich picture of, of, the, of the platform that you're looking to work within. Crucially, the local government can, for example, also impact on the predictability of a given entity to satisfy its legal and financial exposure when a claim does arise. Challenges can also be discovered in being able to perform simple business searches, such that you are, for example, maybe unable to clarify whether you're trading with a financially, financially stable um, asset-driven business or a company with no substance and no assets. Contracting in unfamiliar jurisdictions can as well raise additional issues from a liability standpoint, uh, liability insurance standpoint, sorry. Um, you know, it, is it pre-agreed pre within your um, insurance portfolio to trade in, in a particular country or, or are there exclusions in place? Often it's at the contract review stage that many unintended costs and consequences can simply be avoided by taking proper care and ensuring a standard and thorough processes in place, both from a due diligence and unfamiliar jurisdictions perspective. When considering a contract, it's important to ensure that you include a clause stating the applicable governing law and jurisdiction, creating certainty again in the event of a dispute. Where possible, seek to incorporate a familiar law and jurisdiction clause. This will usually be the law and jurisdiction of the state or place in which you undertake your business and where your business is established. Often, National Association Standard Trading Conditions provide for the relevant law and jurisdiction, and freight forwarders are advised to check with this with their national association and to incorporate standard trading conditions as appropriate. It's helpful to specify a course of action to be followed in case a dispute arises. Um, this may involve consideration of a clause allowing for mediation, for example, and if needed, when mediation, it does not succeed, an arbitration clause to prevent lengthy and expensive court litigation from taking place. This should be a mediated decision, again, across the parties, and ideally under the advice of a local in-house or external counsel. Um, just to maybe wrap up these two slides, there's an old adage which applies very much, I think, in the context of contract review and the subjects that we're covering here. If it, is, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. Uh, freight forwarders should be mindful of this and ensure that they have a, a consistent, and well-documented process in place to conduct due diligence and ensure cross-checking with trusted sources. And I think hopefully the, the guidance document that we've published recently will really help to provide a, a solid platform from which to work moving forward. I think that was the, the last of my slide. Andrea, if we can hand over to John. Okay. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or perhaps I'll settle on good day to cover all time zones. Um, firstly, my thanks to Fiata for inviting me to speak today. I feel very privileged to be doing so. Um, having to follow Manuel and Mike's first class presentations could prove challenging, but I'm a forwarder first and foremost and therefore used to challenges. So uh, here we go. Um, there's probably going to be some overlap between our presentations today, um, but hopefully there are no contradictions, which is probably the, uh, the most important thing. I'd like to start by reiterating that whatever you have written down or whatever you draft, never assume the other party fully understands shipping. It is unfortunate, but fact that in most instances, contractual terms or trading conditions are only looked at after something has gone wrong. Many, and I'm afraid that will include the customer, do not realize that shipping in particular is based on ancient concepts and that each sailing is a venture and all parties can share risks, such as general average. In the event that there is a fire on board a vessel, or something as unlikely as a vessel getting stuck in the Suez Canal. Unfortunately, a declaration of general average is something that we have all become more aware of in recent times. I mention this um, to emphasize the importance of communication. Standard trading conditions must be incorporated by communication and those communications must be acknowledged. Please do be aware of any counter offer that may be hidden in an acceptance as the lawyer will always look to see who fired the last shot and we all want to avoid the battle of the forms. Uh, moving on to contract drafting. So really now the, the, the content of my presentation today, which is contract drafting, 
national STCs and the essential clauses, it would be sensible to establish the principal points of agreement on a subject to contract basis by way of either a heads of terms or a memorandum of understanding, or even just some simple bullet points that can be acknowledged by both parties before heavily involving lawyers. This will help you to keep the costs down. As many of you will know from first-hand experience, negotiating and finalizing of contracts is often a lengthy process. Should you find you're under pressure to commence services before finalization of the contract, do ensure that standard trading conditions are in force. They will provide you with protection. Please do not be tempted to use a template contract or cut and paste from a previous contract. This practice is fraught with danger and amongst other failings may leave you in breach of local legislation. I cannot emphasize strongly enough that your standard trading conditions must be at the heart of any contract or logistics agreement you're involved with. Any derogations or deviations from standard trading conditions should form a part of the agreement. Do not actually remove reference to your standard trading conditions from the agreement or change the standard trading conditions. In the case of an agency or a forwarder cooperation agreement, it is worth mentioning that you should never assume that even though your partner is a freight forwarder, that they will be totally knowledgeable or even that they are free to contract with you. Many forwarder cooperation agreements contain an exclusivity clause, so proceed with caution. One important aspect is that your agency partner will be in a different legal regime, so the legal status of both parties must be agreed. Be aware of potential contradiction of terms between the agreement negotiated and signed and differing transportation documents that will be used, such as the bill of lading. Throughout negotiations, keep your insurers advised to ensure the appropriate coverage is in place. It is there for your protection. Do not be rushed. Give yourself time to consider each and every amendment requested. Evaluate the risk. Using a lawyer will help protect you and also present an image of professionalism. Mike mentioned the National Standard Trading Conditions, and I'd like to expand on that a little bit. The, um, most countries throughout the world will have a National Forwarders Association. Here in the UK, it is the British International Freight Association, known to many of you as BIFA. In just about all instances, the National Forwarders Association will have its own set of standard trading conditions. These will be tried and tested and readily available for use by that country's paid up trading members. Access to the National Association Standard Trading Conditions is probably the largest single benefit of joining the relevant National Forwarders Association. So make full use of them. Many National Forwarders Association Standard Trading Conditions are based on the FIASA model rules on how to draft National Standard Trading Conditions. As many of you will be aware, these model rules were updated recently and presented at the FIASA conference in Cape Town in October 2019. <coughs> With agency agreements, where each party is likely to rely on their own National Forwarders Association standard trading conditions, it is important to note the other country's standard trading conditions will need to be compared with your own for any discrepancies and those discrepancies resolved or a compromise reached. Please don't overlook the fact that there are many conventions that are international law that will generally override standard trading conditions. Just as there are often gaps between your own organization's levels of liability and those of your subcontractors, there can be liability gaps between such conventions and standard trading conditions or between conventions themselves. For example, US COGSA, the Carriage of Goods by Sea Act, US dollars 500 per package, and Hague Visby, uh, SDR, special drawing rights, 666.67 per package. Moving on to essential clauses, um, all of them, or quite simply, if the clause or term is not essential and relevant, it should not be included. You don't want to complicate matters by confusing people with too many options, but perhaps the most common essential clauses to include are as follows. The incorporation of the standard trading conditions. This has to be the best start point. These will cover many of the essential items. Definitions. 
provide a clear glossary of the terms used, e.g. SDR, special drawing rights, and reference to the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. The scope of services, the work to be performed. We want to be clear on that. It avoids confusion later. The term of the agreement, that is, what is the length of the agreement, when is notice to be given, and such like. Undoubtedly, during the course of a contract or an agreement, there are likely to be some variations required. So a clause as to how amendments or variations to the agreement should be dealt with. One of the most important clauses is perhaps the lien clause. It's one of the forwarder's best friends, or it is if handled correctly. This provides an interest over the goods or transport documents to secure outstanding payments. A lien must be used with caution, and of course, legislation varies across different jurisdictions. Not something to be taken lightly. Um, using a lien may well draw a conclusion to your commercial relationship, but if the debt is sufficient, then it's obviously advantageous to uh, take effect. Clarify the forwarder's responsibilities. That is, what will you be doing? Are you clear on that? Is your client clear on that? Are you likely to be acting, or sorry, are you going to be acting as an agent or acting as a principal? Just stating one or the other is not necessarily as clear as it sounds. It's also what you do in practice. Be sure to include a clause to state that there's no insurance unless agreed in writing. And if that insurance is to be provided, who is to pay for the cost of those premiums? Will you or will you not be agreeing to handle dangerous goods, movement of personal effects, COD shipments or other types of uh, classes of shipment? There will be clauses to include what the customer is responsible for and perhaps some indemnity clauses where the customer will indemnify you that amongst other things, the details provided are accurate, e.g. dimensions, the weights, the description of the goods, so that you can handle them correctly. The client should also indemnify you for general average claims. There should be a clause to cover your ability to pass on additional costs incurred. It won't surprise you, perhaps, that this is usually covered in the standard trading conditions. You should include a dispute resolution clause, an entire agreement clause, a clause covering liability and limitation, force majeure, Notice of claim limits, time in which to notify of a claim, time in which to bring suit, etc. And in the jurisdiction and law, incorporate an acceleration clause and state clearly which law to apply. I'd encourage you all to have a current copy of your own standard trading conditions and equate yourself fully with them. Well, hopefully you're all able to take away something of value from today's presentation. Um, for my part, if you do not have in-house legal counsel or a relationship with a suitable firm of lawyers already, then I would strongly recommend that you seek to locate a lawyer with the necessary shipping and forwarding knowledge to assist you with your contract drafting and negotiations. Please remember that your National Forwarders Association may be able to provide you with some recommendations. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much to all of our speakers today for their very valuable and insightful presentations. I think we really learned a lot of all the different um, aspects throughout the contracting journey that we might need to pay attention to. Um, and now I would just like to present to you very quickly the best practice guide from FIATA that was produced by the ABOM, um, to, which provides guidance on contract management best practices. Um, as we've tried to do within this, uh, this session, we've really tried to follow the journey of the contracting process and to help Fruit Forwarders to develop a practical contract management protocol for use in their daily business. And um, we would like to stress at this stage that these are really recommendations and they should really should not be taken as legal advice in any way whatsoever. So, um, for, and this also goes for everything that we've um, said throughout this presentation. So, um, of course, um, now we've provided some very high level um, best practices and some uh, recommendations and um, and considerations as to 
what to look out for, but you're really advised to seek your own legal advice. And of course, to contact your own national association for guidance, particularly taking into consideration um, the local conditions as well. Um, so now I will just take this opportunity to quickly share with you um, the, the best practice guide on the website. Um, and, it, and as you'll see, you'll be able to find it under theater.com and um, then it will be under resources and practical guides. And there you'll be able to find the best practice guide together with um, or the other past best practice guides um, that have been produced by ABLM as well as other um, important guidance from theater overall. So I'm just changing my screen over here. So you'll see here, it's a really an interactive guide and um, it's something that we've tried um, to really put into a, into a way that would be um, very much um, user-friendly and uh, very clear and concise. So um, as you'll see here, we're going through the different um, aspects from negotiation, as uh, mentioned by Manuel, through to um, a drafting review, through to signature, through to performance, and then also taking into consideration the different types of contracts over here. And then we finish it off with a practical checklist. So if I can just go through very quickly, um, we've put it into really key bullet points over here to look at some of the different aspects, for example, in due diligence, which is really a lengthy process and um, something that um, is, as uh, Mike's, uh, uh, Mike uh, mentioned, extremely important in being able to assess the viability of the entity with which you're, with which you're contracting with, and also to ensure that um, when you're contracting in unfamiliar jurisdictions that you're, you really have a firm grip on the process. We then move on to negotiation and then drafting and review. Essential clauses with different some of the different um, uh, different aspects that we should that we really encourage you to look out for in particular. But of course, this does not cover everything, and there are many other essential clauses that will be very important for you to bear in mind. Moving on to signature and execution of the contract, performance of the contract, looking at record management and accessibility of the contracts, which, as we've mentioned, is extremely important in being able to have a strong management protocol for the whole contracting process. Um, we put some aspects into some of the different types of contracts in terms of contracts with subcontractors and contracts with clients. Moving on to a practical checklist, which maybe you'd like to keep close by um, throughout your, your business, just to have some, uh, some um, general considerations that you um, would like to look out for. And um, here, I would like to stress as well that, um, of course, when we're providing this checklist and all these aspects, this is really from a global perspective because um, FIATA is really um, taking everything from a global standpoint as the International Federation of Freight Forwarders. So um, this is something that we would encourage you to go to your national associations. For those national associations who are on the call, um, we would also encourage you to really use this guide to, um, to and leverage this guide in your national context and consider how this can be developed and adapted within your national context to really be able to um, further um, go into further details with, uh, with your own members and, and to take into consideration the different aspects that might be relevant in your context. As John mentioned a lot with the standard trading conditions, that's just one um, key example of where your national association would come in very handy in being able to really tailor a bit more this, this um, general guide. And uh, finally, um, I would also just like to stress, as mentioned by, um, by uh, Dr. Yang, that this is a live document and the intention is really that um, the ABLM experts um, would look at this document and review it on a regular basis so every few years, for example, when there's a major change and to really keep on updating it so that it remains a valuable and a relevant resource for um, theater members overall. So I'm just going to switch my screen back. And um, I'm just about to open the floor for um, questions and answers. Um, but just before that, I would be, uh, I very much welcome Ms. Angela Song from China Merchants Group. And um, she will be happy to give a few words from an in-house perspective. 
Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Andrea, for handling the floor. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Angela. I had the honor of working for in the Secretariat for ABOM before and now work as a corporate counsel and like to echo some main points uh, that is presented in this best practice paper and share of, uh, some of my personal experience and lessons learned uh, regarding contract management. Oh, I fully agree with the main philosophy of the paper that contract management is an entire process. It has a long life circle. It's not just contract review. Uh, it should start with contract negotiation and last until the contract is fully performed with no dispute left behind. So it's very important that the management level of the company, of the free forwarders, that they realize this and give all the resources needed to build such a process. So if there's any part missing, it's really possible that something can go wrong and you may need to devote extra amount of time and money just to get things fixed. Uh, so, for, for example, in terms of contract negotiation, like what Manuel has already mentioned, uh, nowadays we see that the freight rate keeps rising, but you might have some long-term contracts that you signed earlier before that use the payment terms for lump sum uh, freight or fixed rates with the clients. So, in this situation, when the freight rate keeps rising, you may face substantive losses. Um, it might be challenged within the company where, why this contract are signed uh, in this form. Well, it's very complicated, but my personal view is that the rate terms are in the essence commercial risks. So um, if you have some clients that insist to have a lump sum uh, fee terms to control their overall transport expenses, well, even though it's very attempting to um, accept the client's requirements to win the business, especially when the market is highly competitive, well, the business personnel uh, still need to consider the risk of possible rate increase uh, during the, the contract negotiation and a rate adjustment mechanism is better in place. Otherwise, if the rate arises unexpectedly like this year, uh, it would be very difficult to try to renegotiate the terms and uh, control the losses later. And secondly, about the contract signature, formality really matters for signature and wrong format may lead to the contract to be ineffective. Uh, for example, in China, the parties normally require the contract to be affixed with a company seal. And some we even further require that it's signed by the legal representative or an authorized representative of the company. Well, my company's rule is that if the counterparty sends another person, it's not a legal representative who signs the contract, then we normally require that they also present a power of attorney, a POA, authorizing that person to sign the, sign the contract. But we recently had a case where such requirement is not fulfilled, and it turned out that the signatory is not authorized at all, and then the sale is also fake. So again, some formality requirements uh, may seem to be burdensome uh, in many occasions, but they are really very necessary precaution against possible disputes. And the last point is about contract performance. Uh, as mentioned, it's part of the contract management process. Well, it's highly advised that the corporate council shall has a supervisory function over the contract performance. Um, it's not that to say that he or she needs to supervise each and every step of the contract performance but he needs to be authorized to conduct random review or unscheduled check uh, of the contracts to see whether they're performed in compliance with the contract themselves, uh, with company corporate rules, with laws and regulations, whether due diligence is properly done and uh, whether document, documents are kept as required. Again, documentation and record keeping can be crucial, especially for to deal with possible disputes at a later stage. And the details has already been mentioned in the paper. Okay, so that's all for my input. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angela, for um, providing this um, insightful viewpoint from the in-house perspective. Um, so now I would just welcome any questions that anyone may have. Um, as mentioned, you can feel free to use the questions and answer um, function on Zoom, which you can find on the bottom and to submit your questions in writing and we'll endeavor to, um, to answer your questions as much as possible. 
So um, I see we've already had our first question, which is directed um, to John. So um, the question is, um, if I understand correctly, is um, when, um, when we sign um, an agency agreement with our overseas agents covering on the payment of freight and other relevant charges, um, do we include our national standard trading conditions? Okay. Um, yes, I would recommend that you do share your standard trading conditions with the other party, so your overseas agent. Um, depend on whether it's a reciprocal trading arrangement or if they're just sending to you or you to them. It's going to depend how those terms are applied, but you should make the the other party full aware of your trading terms and conditions and seek their trading conditions at the same time and then agree when they will apply. So it could be that for your sendings overseas, um, they're dispatched under your bill of lading using your documentation until received by your counterpart overseas. And then from that point in time, it may be their local national trading conditions that apply. But Yes, it's important that you share exchange terms and acknowledge those terms, giving you each the, uh, the opportunity to question or disagree with any specific items, depending on the relevance of them to the, uh, the contract in question. Great. Thank you very much, John. Um, so just waiting to see if there are any further questions from anybody. So maybe... Uh... Yeah. yeah, if I might, so I, I would have a, a question to our panelists. So uh, we, to the, during today's presentation, we, we heard a lot of uh, interesting and relevant advice. If you would have to choose one piece of advice in particular, what would it be? I don't know who wants to take it. Um, I mean, I guess maybe we could all take that individually. Um, you know, we may, may each have a different view on that. If I go first, if I may, um, simply from my point of view, I would say um, get to know your own standard trading conditions. Um, I know I harped on about it a lot within my little presentation, but those trading conditions are there. They are tried. They are tested. They're proven and they can be your best shield, your best defense if problems arise. So um, acquaint yourself fully with the trading conditions. Um, from my perspective, I guess, um, and from the insurance sort of side of things, it, it really is sort of consider the potential risk exposure for your business. Um, there'll be many sort of um, sales driven roles uh, within the logistics industry where revenue and turnover are the primary focus. Really, I guess the, the one takeaway from my side around sort of due diligence and whatnot is to take a step back and, and kind of consider the potential um, risk exposure financially to your business. Um, you know, a, a really lucrative um, contract from a, a revenue and turnover perspective might be largely and horribly outweighed by a, a, a nasty dispute or, or claim that arises a few months or even a few years down the line. So, yeah, that, that would be my, my main point. Thank you. Um, I think I'm going to be a bit more academic probably. Um, um, I try to keep close to practice, uh, but as you know, I, I already not come from academia, uh, and I would refer to a general idea to answer that question, uh, which is more or less restating uh, what Mike and John have already said, probably, but in a briefer way and, and more theoretical way, for sure. Um, my advice would be to keep certainty, okay, to avoid any surprises, uh, particularly as to the contract and, and the expected results, okay, that has to do with all the things that Mike and John um, have, have uh, rightfully pointed out, uh, which is knowing your contract and knowing your counterparty and knowing, of course, all the details of the transaction and, and managing them, um, you know, in the proper way uh, with all the, the detail possible and, and always uh, with the aim to ensure certainty, avoiding surprises in brief. Yeah. Great, thank you very much. And um, then we have a question here, which is how to proceed when there is a difference between the standard trading conditions in different jurisdictions? Hmm. So I don't know who wants to take that. Um, maybe, I don't know whether John, since you have you covered uh, standard trading conditions in your presentation, yep. you might wanna give a few words. 
No, I, I think the, um, there are going to be a number of commonalities between the standard trading conditions. Um, but yes, you're right, there will be occasions where there will be variances. And I think it comes down to, you know, what, what is that difference and how is it best overcome? Um, it's another of those where you communicate, you negotiate, you reach an agreed compromise. So that it's clear, it's black and white. You remove that gray area. Great, thank you very much. That's very helpful. And um, we just have a few more minutes for um, questions. Um, we have one here. When we sign the overseas agents contract, what should be um, the applicable law and arbitration um, clause? Yeah, I, I can, I guess we all three can, can take that to question possibly, but yeah, just to give uh, an initial answer. Um, normally, normally we would have the, the, the right or the chance to choose the applicable law to the contract, okay? And, and ideally that should be part of our strategy as well, to identify the law that we want for our contract. Um, um, this is something you can address actually in, in the uh, general terms, in the standard general conditions. Um, one thing we may find in some cases is that um, agency contracts, this is thinking of, of probably, yeah, all the kinds of agency contracts are focusing on goods or, or other services. But in any case, agency contracts may be subject to mandatory laws, uh, such as, for example, here in, in the European Union. Um, and, and if that happens, we have to know and therefore get to know the law and try to manage also how it would apply to our, to our contracts as well. As to the uh, jurisdiction or arbitration issues, uh, this is uh, quite a functional um, uh, element as well. Um, it, very briefly, this is something I would say this is something it's very um, uh, convenient to consider in our contracts. Uh, but here the choice would be to, you know, to have in our contract whatever suits best our needs. Um, uh, as this is highly technical. Normally, uh, they should rely, this decision should rely on the advice of the lawyer. Um, and, and yeah, here the lawyer would normally press. Uh, uh, now he's back. Yeah. I'm sorry, you, uh, I saw you, you lost the last part of my speech. Yes, you froze yeah. us. <laughs> but, but that's okay. I mean, let's continue because otherwise we will spend too much time. I want to let you <laughs> speak as well. So, <laughs> Thank you very much. And um, I'm just going to ask one final question, which is, um, I'm not sure who wants to take this, maybe Mike from the insurance perspective. Um, if a freight forwarder, having not seen this best practice guide, inadvertently um, entered into a contract that exposes it to too much risk, uh, too much liability, what would be your advice to mitigate that risk? Okay, thank you. Um, I think maybe a starting point to, that, to answer that question is, is a point that John raised earlier on, and kind of un unfortunately, the, the sort of um, the realisation uh, comes only when something goes wrong and, and the hope is that something doesn't go catastrophically wrong on that occasion. Um, but the, the overarching advice, I think, is to act quickly. Um, easier said than done, I appreciate, but ideally before something does go wrong. Um, yeah, it, there's an importance, I think, in engaging with business leaders internally. Um, transparency within the business will help to, of, of what the risk exposure might be, will help those in, in positions of authority to assess the risk and how best to proceed. Uh, what, for example, was the rationale in entering the contracts in the first place, that there, there may well have been good reason to accept the exposure. Um, you know, some contracts are signed in the knowledge of an exposure existing, but on the basis that the, the risk is simply acceptable. Um, also, where appropriate, after that sort of stage has, has been completed, it would be to engage with the liability insurer um, or broker as early again as possible um, and with as much detail as possible about the contract. And again, um, before there is a dispute is, is of greatest assistance. Um, the contract can then be fully fully sort of considered by the, the liability insurer and hopefully and where appropriate possible arrangements can be made to cover either some or all of the risk presented uh, to your business. And again, providing protection to, to your business. 
Um, but again, there's a couple of words that I think have been used many, many times in the, in the presentation, and it's sort of a mutual agreement, but also the important one, certainty. Um, having realised that there's a potential exposure, assessing it internally and with liability insurers, either way, whether, the, whether, whether it becomes an insurable risk or not, your business has certainty as to what the exposure is. And I think that's a, a really sort of important takeaway. Um, if, if issues are realised, whether after a loss or just through contract review, acting upon them quickly is, is absolutely the key, uh, key to mitigating the risk. Thank you very much, Mike. And um, uh, once again, a big thank you to all of our speakers for this presentation. Um, I'm very pleased now to welcome um, the theatre president, Mr. Basil Peterson, to give a few uh, words as, um, uh, as a closing for this session. Um, but I think you're on. Uh, yeah, yeah now I think you're off mute now. Well, I think the phrase was uh, either good day to all or good morning, good afternoon and good evening, uh, wherever you might find yourself at this particular time. Uh, you know, I, I, must, I must admit that, you know, when you're in any uh, uh, webinar or any discussion uh, this interesting and this important to our industry, <laughs> one hour never seems uh, sufficient for, for us to go through all these and uh, yeah, you know, I think maybe if one hour is the norm, then we should have more of these, you know, it would, it would certainly, I'm, 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 I'm very sure that all our members would really and truly appreciate that. Um, you can go on forever here. Yeah. I'm sure the questions can roll in and uh, the discussion can continue. And Professor would be able to give us his whole, <laughs> his, his whole uh, uh, write up on it and so will Mike do you know so I, I, I really believe that uh, maybe uh, uh, next time the, the secretariat would have a look and see whether we can have these a little bit more frequent I, I would really appreciate that and I'm sure everybody else would but uh, uh, thank you very much uh, to all participants I think uh, you know let me just say that uh, thank you very much for, 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 for participating in the uh, ABLM, and I would like to, to, to say what it really is, advisory body legal matters, because these very few of us fully understand or appreciate this, so it's best that we, we spell these out so everybody knows that we're talking legal matters here. Uh, this, this webinar on contract management, um, a topic which uh, you know, we all will agree has become uh, you know, ever, ever more cru crucial in, in today's challenging times. Viara is pleased to see the considerable interest uh, sparked by this webinar and the publication of the ABLM Best Practice Guides on Contract Management. I would like to take this opportunity to, uh, to thank uh, Advisory Body Legal Matters Chair and the Advisory Body Legal Matters Experts, as well as the Fiata Headquarters team, uh, without whom the organization of this uh, would not have been possible. So thank you very much. The, the experts uh, speaks uh, at, at, at this the experts speaks of this event uh, address many important aspects throughout the contracting process with many key takeaways to be retained. Of particular note is the importance of involving all relevant stakeholders throughout the process. I, I think we cannot deny that, that that came through all the time. Another crucial aspect is the importance of due diligence. Uh, as underlined several times by our speakers. I'm sure you will all agree that this can really prevent serious and far-reaching risk to our business. And as was stated uh, earlier, these always comes after the event. <laughs> so yes, I, I was taught by, uh, by a professor at university that, you know, the, the, the contract for marriage is never drawn up for the marriage, but it is for the divorce. And I think it's the same would apply here, that, you know, we have to be careful as to where we go. So I would once again take this opportunity to, to thank the ABLM for its work in producing this best practice guide, which is just one of many important and comprehensive resources produced by the body. The ABL will now focus on its other projects, notably a research paper on electronic contracts, and we'll review this best practice guide on contract management on a periodic basis to ensure it remains up to date. And I'm looking forward to all this excellent work to be done. As the FIATA body that provides crucial legal 
guidance for the freight forwarding industry participants who may have any topics that would be of interest for ABLM are invited to contact the FIATA headquarters. And with that, I would like to thank all participants and wish you all a very, very good week ahead. Thank you very much for a most insightful event. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, President, and um, thank you everyone who has attended this webinar. I hope it has been um, very valuable and insightful for your, um, for your businesses. And as the President mentioned, if you have any um, uh, particular questions or if you have any, um, anything that you would like the advisory body on legal matters to look at, please do not hesitate to contact the FIATA headquarters and we can definitely look into that. So thank you very much. Wishing you a good day um, or good evening, wherever you are, and um, hope to see you soon.